Good morning, everybody. Hope everybody had a great holiday, long holiday weekend. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And as usual, we're just giving a moment to uh, everybody hop in. Uh, we don't have any COVID updates today. Uh, we will have more updates as they come up, but right now we don't have any major updates from either Dr. Bowman or Dr. Pinsky. Uh, we continue to see um, still a lot of infections within our group. I think every, a lot of people realize that we're all seeing lots of high level of infections within um, our faculty and uh, that'll probably continue to be so for a little bit longer, but we'll continue to give updates, particularly as we see changes um, in trends. Uh, Dr. Bowman uh, will, will be here to update along those lines as well. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Salas, some brief updates, Dr. Salas. Hey, good morning. Uh, thanks for having me on here. Uh, Dr. Rosalga, thanks for hosting. Um, I just wanted to remind folks that uh, we did extend the deadline for the Chair Diversity Investigator Awards to July 15th. Um, so if that's something you were thinking about doing and just hadn't had time to put it together, um, this is your moment. I'll put the link to the information about what's required for that um, into the, the chat. And again, deadline will be July 15th for that. And it's really any research related to either um, diversity on the workforce side or diversity and equity issues on in terms of healthcare delivery. Um, and if you have any questions, um, please contact uh, me, Dr. Dunn, or uh, Lisa Moore Long, or Helena McCombie. No shortage of people you can contact. Um, and, and we hope to see a number of great applicants. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Salas. And uh, so what's awesome is we don't have Again, we don't have a lot of uh, updates today, so we have more time for our main presenter, Dr. Brady. Um, before that, I just wanna briefly mention that we have, of course, as usual, we have our next grand rounds next week, uh, but I do wanna mention next week is the beginning of a, a three-week series, uh, really focusing on public uh, health crises, essentially, both in reproductive rights and gun violence. So we have a two-part series on reproductive rights starting next week and, and then continuing into the week after followed three, three weeks from now from a uh, focus on gun violence. So next week we have Dr. Caitlin Myers. She's a, a doctor of economics and she's gonna be looking at uh, the measure of burden, the effect of travel distance on the incidence of abortions and births. So we're gonna look at that through an economic lens followed by the following week by Dr. Myler. Uh, she's, uh, Dr. Bernadette Myler is, after asking around to all the various professors of law at Stanford, she is the authority on what's really going on in reproductive rights at Stanford. So we're really uh, excited and lucky to have her joining us. And again, as mentioned, Dr. Parsonet, uh, along with uh, Dr. Barnhorst, uh, as well as Dr. Stutter uh, from Stanford, Dr. Barnhorst from UC Davis, will be joining us to have a, a group discussion and presentation on gun violence. So really excited for that. We hope you join us in the coming weeks uh, to cover those sessions. But uh, without further ado, we're really excited to have our own Dr. Brian Brady Dr. Brady, sorry, again, we were, we were really excited to have you come in person and present. Uh, we ended up having to pivot this into an online only event because of the continued infections, um, but we're really excited to have you with us and thank you for taking the time to come and present. Uh, Dr. Chang is our, as you know, our division chief of nephrology uh, is going to introduce Dr. Brady and also be hosting the rest of this event. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Chang now and uh, Dr. Chang, thanks for being here. Sure, good morning, everybody, thank you. Uh, so it's really uh, my honor to introduce you all to Dr. Brian Brady. He's currently a clinical assistant professor uh, in our division here at Stanford. Dr. Brady completed his medical training at Jefferson Medical College, followed by his internal medicine residency and chief residency at Temple University Hospital in Philly. We were then really fortunate to recruit him to Stanford, not only for his nephrology fellowship, where he was uh, one of our chief fellows, our ch the chief fellow that year, uh, but he also then stayed on as faculty. Those of you who have interacted with Dr. Brady in the clinical arena will know him as an exceptionally thoughtful and thorough physician. Uh, as we continue to grow our clinical practice, Dr. Brady has taken on the role of director of East Bay Outreach. And he sees patients not only at our main Stanford campus, but also in Emeryville and Oakland. Dr. Brady's research interests are rooted in value-based healthcare, and he completed a fellowship in this area through the Clinical Excellence Research Center, or CERC. He's published papers on nephrology's role in delivery of value-based care in JAMA internal medicine in some of our top specialty journals. And importantly, Dr. Brady's translating his research expertise into real-world world practice and serves as the Department of Medicine's value-based care champion for our division and as medical director for the UHA CKD Population Health Initiative. Uh, so without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Brian Brady. 
Thank you very much, Tara, for the warm introduction. It's really an honor to be part of our division. Thank you, Errol, Dr. Harrington, the department for the opportunity. All right. As I say, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to join. Uh, I remember uh, July 6th as a first year nephrology fellow going to medical gram rounds in person. It's really an honor to be speaking to the group uh, now several years later. Uh, on that note, a special welcome <clears throat> to our newest members, our interns starting in uh, the last week, and particularly a special welcome uh, to our new nephrology fellows starting today, uh, actually start one starting today on the inpatient consult service with me. So welcome, We're so happy to have you. Uh, in the next 45 minutes or so, I hope to share some thoughts with you about how the changing landscape of how we pay for healthcare in the United States is, go, is not only uh, uh, going to affect nephrology uh, in a major way, but presents a unique opportunity for we as nephrologists to not only be subject uh, to these policy changes, but to take a leading role uh, in how the future of American healthcare reimbursement payment landscape is shaped. A few explicit learning objectives uh, for today's talk. First, I think it's important that we understand what value-based care policy is and how the timeline has come about uh, in the United States. I'm just gonna change my view here for one moment. There we go. Second, uh, for us to understand how nephrology is uniquely positioned, we have to first understand uh, the economics of chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease, and ESKD. You will hear me use both end-stage kidney disease and end-stage renal disease or ESRD throughout the talk today. ESRD is the name that Medicare has assigned to the program. End-stage kidney disease uh, is what we are uh, in the field uh, using these days to describe it. Uh, the third explicit aim is to highlight the opportunities that we in nephrology have uh, for shaping how we deliver better care to our patients with kidney disease. At the outset, I want to want to present a basic roadmap. Uh, when we get into healthcare policy and payment, it can seem a bit like alphabet soup. There are a few points along the way that I hope will make things as clear as possible. First, we have to define the healthcare spending problem in the United States. Following that, uh, I'll take just a few moments uh, for those who may not know the history of the Medicare ESRD program and how it became one of the only disease specific federal entitlement programs in our country. I'll spend some time focusing on what we know clinically about chronic kidney disease and end stage kidney disease, followed by how uh, CMS has tried to use policy evolutions to improve the care that we deliver to our patients. And finally, I'll end with what I think is our specialty's unique opportunity. Two slides. Uh, on very high level uh, data. We all know and have heard that the US spends a disproportionate amount of money per capita to care for our patients. This is, these are data over 40 years from 1970 to 2015 from the World Bank looking at per capita spending by country on the x-axis and life expectancy on the y-axis. And unfortunately you can see that we are quite an outlier spending more than any other developed nation and unfortunately not getting the most basic life outcome uh, in terms of life expectancy for the significant investment that we make in healthcare. More specifically, looking at our uh, nephrology patients, this, these are data showing the annual incidence rates of end-stage kidney disease across varying nations. You can see over here to the left, that we in the United States rank second after the small country of Taiwan in terms of annual incidence of patients with end-stage renal disease. I have two slides on definitions, particularly for our newest house staff, in case they are not familiar uh, with some of the terms that I may be that I'll be using through the talk. Much of this talk will be uh, discussing reimbursement structures, how we pay for healthcare patients with kidney disease in the United States. Fee for service, as many of you know, this is the by far and away the predominant payment model that we have in the United States and have had for many years. This is the idea that we get reimbursed by payers 
for doing more. So if we fix a knee and do a cabbage, we will get paid commensurately for each of those procedures. In the 1990s, in an effort to curb healthcare spending, uh, we experimented in this country with capitation, which is a wholly different payment model where payers will, uh, pro will reimburse providers a fixed rate, usually per member per month, whether their patients get sick or not. The idea behind capitation is that if a provider is getting the same reimbursement, whether their patients are well or sick, they will work to ensure that their patients stay well so that they do not incur the extra costs of when they become sick. Value-based care, which will be the focus of our, the reimbursement structures we'll talk about today, is our effort to try and marry the two. As many of you know, the capitation experiment or uh, uh, HMOs, as, as, many of, uh, as many of the models are known from the 1990s, was not as well received as was hoped. Value-based care is trying to fit a model where providers are incentivized to deliver high quality, lower cost care uh, to patients. And they're incentivized through either payment bonuses or payment penalties based on whether they meet certain metrics. So value-based care is, is, trying to, uh, uh, is trying to find a happy marriage uh, between the fee-for-service system that we live in and practice in uh, and the other extreme of capitation. Many of you will hear this term thrown around the value equation. How is value defined? Very simply, higher quality in the numerator, lower cost, uh, cost of care in the denominator, and services added. This generally tends to mean patient experience. So not only is it important that we deliver high quality care to our patients, uh, but patient experience is now becoming an important metric that CMS and other payers are looking at to determine uh, the quality and the value of the care that we're providing. Uh, just a few minutes uh, on the history of the ESRD entitlement program. Uh, many may know, uh, many probably know, but some may not know, uh, that as soon as a patient in the United States develops or crosses the line between stage five chronic kidney disease into end-stage kidney disease or end-stage renal disease, by far and away, 90% of those patients automatically become eligible for Medicare coverage. Prior to this, you had to either cross the age threshold or be dis uh, qualify as disabled to qualify for uh, Medicare coverage. End-stage renal disease uh, was the first and remains one of the only and certainly most significant disease-specific entitlement programs that we have in the United States many compare it to the closest thing that we have in the US uh, to a single payer system because 90% of patients on dialysis or with end stage renal disease uh, are covered by Medicare. The dialysis really began in the 1940s where in German occupied Holland, Wilhelm Kolff dialyzed the first patient in 1944 with what was called then the artificial kidney. Dialysis then became more prominent during the Korean War and was actually used in the field to dialyze patients with significant rhabdomyolysis or crush injuries uh, and, and the resultant acute kidney injuries. In 1960, building on the uh, artificial kidney, uh, Belding Scribner at the University of Washington developed the first arteriovenous shunt, which is similar to a graft that we have these days, although it was outside of the arm, and successfully dialyzed patients in Seattle. What then became uh, a bit of a cultural phenomenon was that uh, providers had to decide how dialysis would be rationed because it was so expensive, but also life-saving. So there was both a discussion about this in the medical community and also in, in the public. Uh, there were famously an art article published in Life Magazine in the late 1960s about, quote, uh, rationing panels who would decide really who lives and who dies, who gets dialysis and who does not. So the, there was momentum uh, throughout the 1960s building that there was a moral imperative that the government uh, find a way to prolong life for otherwise health, uh, 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 patients that would otherwise be healthy and productive citizens. In the 1960s also kidney transplantation came about 
in the mid 1960s, the VA decided they were going to build dialysis centers and they had the mandate to do that because they cover their patients and are in control of their healthcare costs. Things culminated in 1971 when a patient was brought to the Senate floor and famously dialyzed, short treatment of course, uh, but in a very dramatic way, the case was made to the US Congress that this was a life-sustaining treatment that should be paid for. And then in 1972, actually in the last kind of 11th hour move, uh, a sent single sentence was added to the Social Security Amendments, which was the first expansion of Medicare since its inception in 1965, that said any patient who develops end-stage renal disease should be uh, considered disabled and will be eligible and covered by Medicare. And so this really cast the die for the field of nephrology and how our patients uh, are viewed in the eyes of the payer, and certainly the eyes of Medicare. Uh, and we'll, we'll, this kind of really sets things up for how nephrology is uniquely positioned as this discussion of how we pay for healthcare continues. Around the time of the entitlement in the early 1970s, uh, dialysis was billed as a bridge to transplantation. And in 1971, there were only 4,300 patients on dialysis. As I mentioned before, this was the first federally legislated disease-specific entitlement. So a disease state is now written into law uh, as, uh, as Medicare eligible, Medicare covered. These are data, you'll see some slides throughout the talk from the USRDS, the United States Renal Data System, our kind of uh, hallmark for uh, tracking epidemiological data in our patients with kidney disease. You can see looking back, uh, this is graphing prevalence of end-stage renal disease. So in 2000, there were already about 400,000 patients with end-stage renal disease. And as you can see, this number is climbing uh, continually. Uh, so while it, impl while it implicitly, uh, probably don't have to say this, but, but the, the burden, cost, responsibility of Medicare from the entitlement inception in 1972, when the prevalence was only 4,500 patients, uh, to now has truly ballooned to the point where the end-stage renal disease program costs Medicare about $49, $50 billion a year. Medicare uh, covers, so, so Medicare population, about 1% of all patients have end-stage renal disease, but they account for 7% of all Medicare spending now. Some estimates uh, gauge that the ESRD program costs the U.S. government about 1% of its federal budget total federal budget and the 49 billion that end-stage renal disease program costs the United States uh, is significantly more than the entire NIH budget, annual budget. So this really puts things, I hope to put things into context with this, how uh, significant uh, a program this has grown into for the federal government. So now we have uh, a disease state that is enshrined in law as being covered uh, by the federal government. So now I'll move along to just set things into context about what we know clinically about uh, our patients with kidney disease. So again, very high level, I won't spend too many slides, but on the x-axis here on the left panel, uh, this is looking at uh, glomerular filtration rate or GFR with lower glomerular filtration rates here on the left, higher GFRs on the right. And then the panels show uh, adjusted hazard ratios for cardiovascular mortality, coronary heart disease, stroke, and heart failure. And I think it's very obvious that as the GFR declines, as we move to the left of the panel here, uh, disease states uh, become much more prevalent. Uh, similarly, on the right, you can see panels for uh, ACR, which is albumin to creatinine ratios. As the albumin to creatinine ratio increases, moving from the left, to the right here. You can see that the uh, risk factors for contracting these diseases also rises. So now we have a disease in chronic kidney disease that is associated with significant uh, comorbidity. So you can, I think, begin to see here how we have a complex disease uh, that is, that is uh, enshrined uh, at the end stages uh, as an entitlement program. A little bit more about what we know clinically, I think everybody knows this, but it's worth repeating that we have had well-established treatments to modify the disease course uh, since the 1990s when uh, studies were done looking at captopril, comparing it to placebo, and showing how that there was significant 
uh, reduction in the percentage of patients who doubled their creatinine, percentage of patients who uh, died, required dialysis or transplantation. There were many more studies than these. I only chose two. Another study from 2001 compared Losartan to placebo and showed, excuse me, that there was significant risk reduction again, in the doubling of the serum creatinine concentration development of end-stage kidney disease uh, for the patients on losartan. These, in general, were patients with uh, proteinuric, meaning chronic kidney disease with significant levels of proteinuria or albuminuria. So we have had treatments available to us or at our disposal that are well-founded in evidence uh, that not only modify uh, the course of disease, i.e. slow progression of chronic kidney disease down and keep people off dialysis for longer, uh, but also have significant mortality benefits. These are data from just a few years ago uh, from Chi Shu's group, who's at UCSF. And I want you to focus uh, on this part of the panel here. This is looking at the uptake of ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers as a percentage of patients uh, who have an indication to be on one of these medicines. The indication in this group being patients who were hypertensive with the urine albumin to creatinine ratio of greater than 300 milligrams per gram. And you can see that from 2001 till 2018, there hasn't been significant change in the uptake of these uh, truly powerful uh, medications. The average rate remains around 50%. And so now, we have a disease with highly associated comorbidity with high expense for which the federal government uh, is on the hook for paying when patients develop end stages. We have treatments that we think can bend the progression curve, but unfortunately over the last 20 years, the uptake of these important medications has been modest. And so this is the problem that payers and Medicare uh, face now and have faced for the last 10 years and are trying to figure out how to improve. So there, when we talk about opportunities to improve the value of care, again, improve quality and potentially reduced cost of uh, care provided to patients with chronic kidney disease, there are really five main areas of focus. One is identifying disease early. As you'll see in, in a later slide, uh, too few patients who have chronic kidney disease are aware that they have chronic kidney disease. And it seems silly to have to say, but referring patients to nephrology on the early side, uh, i.e. when the GFR is in the high six, uh, excuse me, high 50s or early stages of stage three, rather than the later stages when there's less disease modification that we can do with medications uh, becomes very important. So ident uh, early identification of disease uh, expanding treatment with disease-modifying medications. This gets at the issue I raised over the last few slides. How do we get more patients for whom disease-modifying medications, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, now SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, certain MRAs, GLP-1 agonists, the, the, the armamentarium is expanding rapidly. How do we get more patients on these truly life-saving and disease-modifying medications? Third is bolster uptake of home dialysis modalities. You'll see in a later slide, home dialysis carries the benefit of improved uh, patient experience. Patients rate higher quality of life because they can control when they do their dialysis rather than having to be at the whims of a dialysis clinic. Uh, and they also carry lower total cost. So to the payer, of course, they become attractive. Improving the transition to dialysis. So once a patient has decided that they will pursue a certain dialysis modality. There is uh, a, a high quality way to start patients on dialysis and there's a low quality way to start patients on dialysis. And improving this transition to actually starting dialysis is a huge focus of, of uh, payers and uh, implementers trying to improve value. And then increasing kidney transplantation. This is of course uh, the holy grail in our field. Um, Kidney transplantation carries even higher uh, quality of life scores from patients for obvious reasons and has the lowest relative cost uh, to Medicare um, by about, uh, by about uh, two thirds less uh, than the in-center hemodialysis, which 
a predominant number of patients with end-stage renal disease begin. I separate the next point um, because this is how policymakers and uh, care delivery uh, leaders have tried to get at the problem. It's been identified for a long time that patients with chronic kidney disease have numerous comorbidities. As I showed you in an earlier slide, they were mainly cardiovascular, but they have endocrine, they have peripheral arterial disease, they have many um, care needs as their chronic kidney disease progresses. And unfortunately, too much of that care is delivered in what people refer to as silos. So there has been a huge push uh, in the payer community, really, and for Medicare, to try and improve how we coordinate the care of patients uh, with advanced stages of chronic kidney disease, and we'll get into that here. Uh, I just wanted to show another uh, epidemiologic slide to give you a sense of the prevalence of where patients are going when they develop end-stage renal disease. So you can see on the top dark blue line here, this is folks starting in center hemodialysis. This is what probably most people are familiar with when they go to a clinic three days a week for their dialysis treatments that they get either through <clears throat> a permanent vascular access or a temporary catheter. The, blue, the green line below is the uh, prevalent count of transplantation and thankfully that's rising as well. You can see though at the bottom that the lines for peritoneal and home hemodialysis, the two modalities, uh, referred to collectively as home dialysis modalities, their lines have not grown too much. In fact, when we look at total uh, prevalence and types of dialysis modalities across three, uh, it's still only about 11 to 12% of patients uh, when they start, they choose peritoneal dialysis, or is only about 1% start, start home hemodialysis. So how has Medicare and CMS tried to get at this, try to uh, focus on some of those uh, high value opportunities highlighted in the earlier slide. Uh, they've tried to use uh, throughout the years, I'll, 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 I hope to show you uh, the progression of their thinking. They've tried to use payment policy to influence practice. So 1973, this is when the ESR uh, RD uh, entitlement program began as we discussed in 2004, a significant payment policy change came about, which is called the MCP or the monthly capitated payment. This is how nephrologists are reimbursed for seeing patients on dialysis. This payment is important. This payment policy is important because it really shaped and continues to drive how uh, nephrologists uh, spend their time and focus their efforts. In short, this payment policy change uh, uh, instituted a payment system where nephrologists are paid on a graduated scale uh, between one and four visits per month with one visit being uh, reimbursed the least and four visits to a dialysis patient per month being reimbursed the most. So you can imagine how practice changed. There are great papers out there showing that within one year, uh, the, the visit frequency to patients on dialysis quickly moved uh, from one to four per month. Uh, just another uh, example of how well uh, providers accommodate to policy changes. So now we have a system where Medicare is paying for folks on dialysis and there is incentive to see those folks on dialysis more frequently. Um, what, I'll, uh, what many have argued is that this payment policy change by changing the remuneration uh, focus towards folks on dialysis, it has perhaps shifted nephrologists attention too much uh, towards those patients on dialysis and not enough on the patients with earlier stages of chronic kidney disease who we might save or push off from having to start dialysis pushback. In 2008, uh, Medicare realized that dialysis clinics were uh, benefiting from the fee-for-service arrangement where they were administering erythropoietin stimulating agents or EPO because the reimbursement for those agents was high. They were uh, administering them uh, perhaps too much. And so they instituted what was the first federal bundled payment where they told dialysis clinics, we're going to pay you the same fee whether you use 
very high doses of epogen or whether you use no doses of epogen. And similarly to the graphs I talked about in 2004, you can see that after this 2008 change, the, uh, uh, the use of epigen at dialysis clinics uh, tapered off dramatically. So another example of where CMS used its policy power uh, to affect and, and change how uh, nephrologists practice. In 2012, the so-called Quality Incentive Program, or QUIP, was instituted. This was Medicare's first mandatory pay-for-performance system, where they said, we're paying for the majority of patients on dialysis. We're going to set quality standards that you have to meet, or there'll be a penalty to your reimbursements. Uh, so this was a, a penalization type program, uh, which uh, uh, tried to uh, uh, drive care from the nephrologists and dialysis clinics to meet certain quality metrics. In 2015 macro, this does not apply exclusively to nephrologists, but includes nephrology quality measures. Uh, this was another um, uh, payment policy change for Medicare that tried to incentivize providers to provide high quality, lower cost and interoperable uh, care. I won't focus too much on macro, although there are specific quality measures pertinent to our patients with kidney disease. A significant change came again then in 2020 through an executive order of all things uh, known as the uh, Advancing American Kidney Health Act with explicit focus on three things, reducing the risk of development of end-stage renal disease, improving patient-centered treatment options and increasing transplantation rates. Uh, in a, in a uh, future slide, I'll detail a little bit more how this the policy change from the AAKH uh, continues to affect uh, our field uh, most prominently now. And then in the uh, 21st Century Cures Act, um, Medicare uh, Advantage coverage was extended to patients with end-stage kidney disease, which, uh, as you can imagine, this has significant implications on how each state's Medicare Advantage uh, plans uh, focus their efforts on patients with kidney disease. So I show this slide um, to drive home the point that uh, because of the significant entitlement that Medicare uh, is responsible for, they have used patients with kidney disease and the providers, i.e. nephrologists, as kind of a testing site or bellwether over the years to, uh, for demonstration projects, you know, bundling payments, pay for performance models, and then as we see uh, in later slides, uh, accountable care organizations. So just a slide uh, again for uh, some of our uh, younger audience in terms of definitions, I'll be using the term risk-based contracting uh, and I, I just want to make sure everybody knows what that is. So there are two types of risk. Upside risk is the potential for value gain. If you meet certain metrics, you're eligible for reward. But if you don't meet certain metrics, you're not exposed or eligible for certain losses. Uh, downside risk is the potential for value loss. Uh, if you don't meet certain metrics, you are uh, potentially uh, eligible or liable for value loss. This is the classic carrot versus stick uh, programs. Uh, another slide here. This is uh, the point of the slide is to show that um, the most recent innovation from Medicare in terms of how they're getting at the healthcare cost problem uh, is by uh, using what are known as accountable care organizations, where Medicare says, we're going to put the responsibility on providers to take financial risk and, uh, and, and, and potentially be uh, exposed to upside risk. So if you do a good job, you provide high quality care, you get uh, higher uh, reimbursement rates, but also be exposed to downside risk. If you don't meet certain metrics, uh, you will not, uh, you'll get penalized. The ACOs were established uh, by the um, uh, uh, ACA Act in, in 2010 under Obama. Uh, these are just showing value-based programs that Medicare has instituted. I won't go through the uh, details of all of them. It's beyond the purposes of today's talk, but what I wanted to show was that of all the models you can see on the timeline here, the models in blue apply to all populations. The models in red are value-based programs specifically focused on patients with kidney disease. 
So the quality incentive payment we talked about. The ESCO experiment began in 2015, where Medicare uh, instituted what was then the first specialty-specific accountable care organization and said, nephrologists and dialysis clinics uh, partner up and, uh, and, and meet certain quality metrics, meet certain cost metrics, uh, you will be rewarded or you will be penalized. Uh, there were many groups uh, that enrolled. This was, a, uh, this was not a mandatory enrollment uh, for the potential of upside risk. CMS thought if the nephrologists and the primary care doctors and the dialysis clinics are working more cohesively, maybe that will get at the silo uh, problem that we talked about earlier. This experiment uh, uh, ran until 2021 and actually results just came out in January of this year where through care coordination efforts between these uh, partnered nephrology practices and dialysis clinics, hospitalization rates were reduced, central venous catheter rates were reduced, and there was a modest cost reduction. Although the caveat that I would add is that once the shared savings were paid out to the groups within the ESCO, uh, the costs uh, were neutral or even a little bit costly. Um, MIPS, uh, we, we, we mentioned that's MACRA, uh, Medicare Advantage expansion now uh, to all patients with end-stage kidney disease. We'll focus a little bit more on these in coming slides. Uh, these two models, uh, the ETC and the KCC, uh, again, I, I'll try not to get lost in alphabet soup, um, but in short, these models are one being mandatory, the ETC and the KCC. These are Medicare's most recent um, evolution of how they're trying to improve the value of care uh, we deliver to our patients with chronic kidney disease. A little bit more on those uh, later. So the opportunity for CKD uh, in a few slides here, I think most people know this, but it's worth mentioning that when you look at the percentage of the population with these significant chronic diseases and you look at the costs incurred or attributed to, these chronic diseases, CKD represents a disproportionate amount of costs for 13% of the population, uh, accounting for 24% of the costs, similar to the 1% of uh, Medicare patients with BSRD accounting for 7% of the costs. I wanna focus just a minute on this slide because this is a huge opportunity. This graph looks at uh, stages of chronic kidney disease and percentage of U.S. adults who are aware that they have it. So getting at one of the high value opportunities I highlighted earlier, the top line here in black shows folks with stage five. This is, of course, the latest stage of chronic kidney disease prior to ESRD and the need for either transplantation or dialysis. And they, as, as one would expect, they have the highest level of awareness, although it's, it's concerning that the level of awareness is decreasing. Uh, similarly, folks with stage four disease, it's encouraging that their awareness is increasing. But really, this green line here showing folks with stage three chronic kidney disease, uh, most folks are not aware uh, that they have it. And this is really the opportunity for we as nephrologists uh, to partner with our primary care, our cardiology, our endocrine colleagues to do a better job of making patients aware of their underlying chronic kidney disease, which unfortunately is largely asymptomatic. So while patients may be suffering from symptomatic disease, it is often uh, challenging for them uh, to come to terms with uh, an asymptomatic disease. Uh, this slide shows duration of pre-ESRD nephrology care. So this is the uh, percentage of patients by age who have seen a nephrologist or gotten uh, of nephrology care prior to starting dialysis. And I always think this is shocking. So about 40% of patients, uh, you can see uh, in, in uh, the green line here, this is patient, these are patients who have had no uh, nephrology care prior to starting dialysis. And then uh, the red and blue here, this is only these are only patients who have seen nephrologists for six or 12 months. Uh, so this is a huge opportunity. It is, it is so unfortunate that there are still a significant number of patients uh, initiating dialysis uh, who, have, who have not had any uh, pre-dialysis nephrology care, especially 
uh, when we have disease modifying medications that we discussed earlier, that could potentially push that off for them. There is a significant opportunity in how we transition patients to either initiating dialysis or getting a transplant. I'll focus on the transition to dialysis. Most patients in the US start dialysis uh, in, uh, in the center, so-called in-center hemodialysis. Uh, this is between 80 and 85% of the uh, ESRD population. This is the most expensive dialysis modality. Uh, like I said before, peritoneal dialysis is about 11% of patients with some reduced cost. Uh, a perfect start, so to speak, or uh, uh, to dialysis is a patient who has known about their chronic kidney disease for some time, has had the opportunity to educate themselves about the options for treatment of ESRD, which most of us, I think, think about dialysis the most, but there's also transplantation and folks who wanna pursue more conservative therapies. Starting those patients with a permanent vascular access in the outpatient setting for those who decide to pursue dialysis is a, uh, carries a huge quality and cost benefit than those patients who have to start in the hospital with a plastic catheter. Uh, this chart here just goes through uh, some of the evidence-based interventions that uh, health delivery systems are focusing on to try and deliver higher value care to their folks with chronic kidney disease. So in the early stages here, we have stage three. This three uh, uh, targets are getting the right patients into see nephrologists, uh, screening for urine albumin to creatinine ratios, and getting the appropriate patients on either RAS inhibitors, SGL2 inhibitors, et cetera, the, the medications that we have in our armamentarium to try and change the course of disease. Really, this is about slowing CKD progression at this stage. As patients move to stage four, they become uh, at risk for more comorbidities, as we saw in an earlier slide. So focus becomes on modifying risk factors for comorbidities and focusing on patient education and engagement so they understand what is to come as their chronic kidney disease progresses and importantly, getting them referred for transplant. So as soon as one's GFR uh, reaches 20 milliliters per minute, they can be referred for transplantation evaluation, which just gets the wheels turning and allows them to start socializing or presenting the idea to family and friends of living donation, uh, of which there are too few uh, in the US. So this, in stage four, healthcare systems, nephrologists, payers are really focused on patient education and access to care. And as they get to stage five, again, how do we live, deliver higher quality, uh, potentially lower cost care to these patients with advanced chronic kidney disease? Much has been uh, uh, made, studied, described about using multidisciplinary teams to try and improve care coordination, make sure patients follow through on their referrals, start the medications that are prescribed. This is also when patients start developing some of the chronic kidney disease related complications, such as volume overload, uh, metabolic acidosis, hyperkalemia that cause costly hospitalizations. Uh, and again, focusing on how do we transition our patients most optimally uh, to dialysis. A huge component of this, I put this on the bottom here because it really underpins the efforts of care coordination across the US and what we're doing here is, is establishing a very strong relationship between the nephrologist and the primary care doctors uh, so that communication can flow freely and we can deliver the best care for our patients uh, as we can. Every, I, I think many people on this call have probably seen this slide before, but I put this up. This is data from a recent study called DAPA CKD which shows a huge opportunity. Again, trying to focus on opportunities we have here. This is um, uh, showing that over the three-year time period of the study, uh, patients who were randomized to receive dipagliflozin uh, had slower rates of chronic kidney disease progression than those on placebo. I, I show this slide actually to my patients in the office when I'm talking about this initial GFR drop and how they should prepare for it, because I think it's really powerful to see that the that the slope, the curve is bent here by starting patients on, uh, on th these medications. And I think our opportunity really with this, these, all of these new medications being added to our armamentarium is to learn from the last 30 years and try and improve the care we deliver uh, in a better way than we did or have done with the ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers.
won't focus too much on this. I just wanted to highlight a few papers that have uh, espoused the use of multidisciplinary care in caring for patients with chronic kidney disease. Um, there have been mortality benefits shown, certainly more guideline-based prescribing when you have uh, uh, people other than the physician following up with patients, making sure that they fill their prescriptions, et cetera. Uh, renal endpoints have been shown uh, to be better. Uh, dialysis starts have been shown to be better, fewer cardiovascular and infection events, slower renal disease progression. So there's, there's quite a bit of data uh, over many years now uh, that continues to espouse the use of multidisciplinary care teams. And certainly I think the quality argument is easy to understand and makes sense. The cost argument that these potentially expensive care teams reduce overall healthcare costs has been harder to prove. Um, I was lucky enough uh, uh, a few years ago to be able to participate in a study where we tried to look at how are nephrology groups across the US who are performing very well in terms of high quality measures and lower cost of care measures, uh, how are they doing it? So we, we ranked uh, 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 practices by certain quality metrics that we identified and total cost of care metrics uh, using a, a private payer database. And we, we, we simply ranked them by highest quality and lowest cost. And then we, uh, after identification, called them up and asked if we could come, come visit and spend some time and observe what might uh, distinguish these uh, high performing practices from more average performing practices. Uh, and then we, our research groups came back and through uh, some, some mixed methods approach, looked at what rose to the top, what were distinguishing care attributes of nephrology practices who are doing all the things that I described above really well. And we, we really highlighted five uh, large target areas, which seem very simple. Preventing near-term costly health crises. This is having uh, extra uh, office space for our sick patients to come in if they need to. Supporting patient self-care. This is the education and engagement piece we discussed earlier. Maximizing the effectiveness of office visits. So making sure medications are wrecked appropriately so the providers are not doing that during the visit. Selecting cost-effective interventions, developing an infrastructure to support high-value care. There are actually uh, several practices who diverted uh, uh, funds from their dialysis program to fund uh, their office-based CKD practices uh, to pay for some of these infrastructural labor costs uh, that come from multidisciplinary care teams. As I, I, I noted before, while the quality argument over the years for multidisciplinary care has been made, the cost argument has been slower to rise to the top, at least of the academic literature, uh, but this has not stopped the private sector from uh, potentially capitalizing on an opportunity. So as Medicare continues to focus on uh, upside risk, if you deliver better care at lower costs, uh, we will pay you more. Uh, many private companies have taken this uh, idea and run and are now um, partnering with nephrology practices, dialysis clinics, using large databases and their infrastructure to say, we can help you achieve these quality metrics. We can use uh, advanced analytics, AI, to identify patients who are progressing quickly so that you can intervene early uh, and save on some of these uh, 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 low quality, high cost events. So I just showed this from a recent paper uh, this year from one of our former fellows actually, uh, that just uh, makes the point that uh, private equity and, and, and private sector investment uh, has really blossomed in the chronic kidney disease area now the payers are really focused on shifting uh, nephrology care priorities to the upstream uh, stages of chronic kidney disease more so than, than end-stage kidney disease. I only show this slide uh, because it, it is uh, becoming hard to escape for nephrologists to not understand, know about these different payment models the KCC or kidney care choices model is one, if you remember from a timeline on an earlier slide, 
that the Advancing American Kidney Health Act put into place. This is an optional model where nephrologists uh, have the option to partner with dialysis clinics uh, to go in, go at risk, go at financial risk for their patient populations. Uh, CMS has put um, uh, programs into place whereby uh, uh, providers in these organizations are rewarded for focusing on patients with stage four and stage five chronic kidney disease, trying to deliver the care uh, that we, we talked about in an earlier slide uh, to, to forestall the initiation of dialysis uh, or improve the transition to dialysis. Um, so the, the details are not as important, but you can see within this optional payment model, there are several uh, different options that providers can choose. And this all becomes very, very challenging for a busy nephrology practitioner uh, to potentially go at risk and decide if they want to uh, change around uh, their reimbursement system from fee-for-service. So what about patient experience? I just want to spend one slide on this. This is, we've talked a lot about quality, reducing morbidity, mortality, hospitalizations, but patient experience is becoming uh, uh, equally important in the, in the eyes of the payer. Uh, again, remember from the quality equation, patient experience is in the numerator. Uh, patient experience now factors prominently into reimbursement formulas for dialysis payments. Uh, the ICH CAPS is an in-center hemodialysis uh, twice annual survey that dialysis patients fill out uh, and providers reimbursements are uh, tailored based on the results of these patient experience surveys. So again, another example of a Medicare a payment policy uh, being kind of pushed onto or, or, or tested in the nephrology community. We found in, in prior studies that we uh, did that um, patient experience varies by provider visit frequency. So interestingly, uh, provider visit uh, patient experience did not always improve with uh, maximum provider visit frequency and, and even varies by dialysis clinic ownership. Uh, just two minutes before I finish, I know I'm getting up to time on our efforts locally in our own healthcare system to try and deliver on what we've discussed uh, today. So I've had the opportunity with the uh, vision of the UHA leadership and also the SHC and value-based care program leadership to try and implement uh, CKD management programs, both within the UHA population and our um, uh, some patients within our, our Stanford healthcare population. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I'm really humbled at this fantastic opportunity to try and mirror what, what some few academic health centers have done across the country to really improve the care we deliver to our patients with chronic kidney disease. So our opportunity in nephrology, when we think about delivering high value care to our patients with kidney disease, there are some headwinds. So incentivizing value in a fee for service system is tough. How do we attribute care appropriately? That is still being debated. Quality metrics are always debated and getting stakeholder buy-in from providers who are used to practicing in a fee for service system is a strong headwind. But there, I would argue, are stronger tailwinds. So there's a national spotlight now on chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease, particularly the cost of care because of the entitlement program. CMS is shifting its payment policies, not just within nephrology, but across the board to reward value, higher quality, lower cost care. There are precedents for this in the US. And I think the best of all is the payers are incentivizing, incentivizing us to, to do the right thing. All of the quality measures, all of the interventions that I discussed here, this is what this is the kind of care that you would want for you as a patient or a family member as a patient. And I think that that's probably the strongest tailwind we have to really capitalize on this opportunity to do the right thing. Either way, I think nephrology is, a, is uniquely positioned because of the ESRD entitlement program to be subject to policy changes, ongoing policy changes, the opportunity for us is really to be at the table and try and lead uh, these changes as they continue to come down uh, from Medicare. Uh, with that, I just wanna acknowledge all the, the folks who have helped me uh, put this work together. Uh, my primary research mentor, mentor Glenn Chertow, and of course, uh, Tara Chang, our division chief. Uh, my mentors at CERC, Arnie Milstein, Terry Plachik, Bob Kaplan, and then the groups uh, within the value-based care program and SHC, 
uh, of course, Dr. Harrington, uh, Rob Fairchild, Rhea Paul, and uh, the leadership at uh, University Health Alliance uh, and, and University Medical Partners, Dr. Sankari, David Overton, uh, and Somia, to give me the opportunity to deliver uh, on what we've written about now for many years and improve the care we deliver to our patients with kidney disease. Thanks very much. Great, thank you so much, Brian, uh, for taking this really complicated uh, topic and breaking it down in a very uh, clear and easy to understand way. Uh, sentiments that are echoed um, by Dr. Richard Lafayette, who also uh, you know, says thank you for making this more clear. There are some questions uh, uh, in the chat and um, we have a few minutes, so keep them coming. Uh, there's a, a first question, it's sort of an interesting concept from uh, Dr. Ed, Edward Leibowitz, uh, who asks, um, as an upstream solution, do you think there's a dose of ACE inhibitors or other medications, maybe like SGLT2 inhibitors, that would actually make them safe enough to be available over the counter? And do you think that would move the needle on this like 40%, 50% that we've seen for 20 plus years? Um, what I would say, and Terry, you, you could probably contribute more to this, but uh, what we know is that most providers want to do the right thing and, and they start patients for whom an ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker is indicated get started on the medication. Uh, but then they often get discontinued on the medication when either follow-up labs show an increased potassium concentration or an increased serum creatinine concentration. So I, I, I think that it's more about... Um, making providers comfortable with what to expect when starting medications so that they are not uh, discontinued and then not restarted. Um, but, but perhaps uh, Tara might have some ideas about making these <laughs> over the counter. Yeah, I think there'd be some fights with the pharmaceutical companies there, but um, I, I think you're right that I, th I don't think it's just accessibility. I think it really is um, ed education of, uh, you know, across the spectrum of providers to get them to get them uh, used. Um, another question, interesting question, um, an important one that is, can primary care really refer a patient to you in nephrology with, a, with just a GFR of less than 50? Is that an appropriate referral? I would say yes. I would say yes. There's lots of data to show that earlier nephrology referrals um, are better for patients in the long run in terms of uh, slowing disease progression, getting them on these evidence-based medications. So I'd say um, uh, absolutely. And I didn't show it, but there's an excellent um, heat map uh, that shows um, risk of disease progression by GFR graphed against your albumin to creatinine ratio. What I would say is if there's a patient that you're wondering uh, if they should be referred by GFR alone, if they have not had their urine albumin to creatinine ratio checked, uh, this would be the first step because we know that most of the associated comorbidities are, are driven uh, by the albuminuria, by the proteinuria, perhaps more so uh, than the GFR. Yeah, great, good, great point. Uh, a question from Ulyssa Rodriguez. Um, she says, thank you for your presentation. How would you recommend addressing patient concerns about home dialysis uh, in terms of safety, being a burden on their, on their care providers, et cetera, to bolster the use of home modalities? So data has shown, and I think providers would agree that if we give patients more time to discuss this with either us or the care team to ask questions, to interact with the dialysis nurses who actually go through, do home visits, uh, and determine whether patients uh, are reasonable candidates for home dialysis. If more time is devoted, it's been shown that more patients uh, uh, choose home dialysis. And this is what some of those uh, private companies uh, have engaged in, uh, which is really patient education platforms, videos from prior patients describing their experiences, uh, really just giving patients more time to consider uh, weigh the options and make their decision. Yeah, and I would also add, um, you know, there's there's uh, at Satellite Healthcare and others, they're trying to have assisted uh, programs where someone in the short term will come into the home with the patient and help uh, transition them onto onto these home modalities, so that they're not having to do it all all on their own. Um, so I think we've got maybe one more time for one last question from Dr. David Sachs, and I'll just read it. it says since private private equity funds have historically sought to slash costs in new acquisitions uh, for, for their profits, do you think their involvement in nephrology becomes a Faustian bargain? 
That's a weighted question. Uh, I, what I would say is that I think the reason I talked about the private firms being involved is that I think the literature has been slow to, to demonstrate that these programs are cost saving. Some are cost effective, but cost saving has been more difficult to demonstrate. And I think that I, I show that to, to, to uh, kind of showcase that there are folks out there who uh, are kind of running with this and, and engaging in risk uh, who think that they, they can beat the odds and take on the risk. And I think, I think in general, it is helpful because I think it has propelled the use of um, these partnerships uh, and these care models uh, forward. Yeah, and we'll have to see how it turns out. It's it's early days. Yeah, All it's right. very early. It's very early. Either way, though, I think you know nephrology has to be at the table. We'll see how the the story gets written. Right. Wonderful. Well, it's nine oh one. Thank you again so much, Dr. Brady, and thank you everybody for joining us. Have a good day.